Well, today we are considering what we do call uh, understanding the two natures of Christ. Understanding the two natures of Christ. Now, this is a very important subject for us to indeed pay close attention on to. And why is that one very important? Understanding the two natures of Christ is indeed crucial to our faith. Number one, why do we say it is indeed crucial to our faith? It is crucial since the two natures of Christ, they are a part of the essential doctrines of salvation. When we talk about essential doctrines of salvation, we are saying that these are doctrines that one needs not to go wrong about. The Trinity, the two natures of Christ, the virgin birth, talk about the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, how indeed walked in all perfection, observing all the law, and uh, talk about the cross, talk about the resurrection, and talk about the ascension. And then the issue of knowing that salvation indeed is by grace through faith alone. So those are what we call cardinal doctrines. We call them essential doctrines. However, there are others that are actually non-essential. But when we do talk about the subject of the two natures of Christ, it is indeed an essential doctrine for us to consider. Because what one believes about the two natures of Christ speaks a lot whether that individual is truly born again or not. So one has to be sound about what he or she believes about the two natures of Christ uh, existing in one person. Just to do a simple recap, the Apostle John, though he was very elaborate enough about the divinity and the humanity of Christ in his gospel and in his episodes, in the later years of the first century, John dealt with a group of heretics that were known as the Docetists. These people actually replaced the incarnation of Christ with a heresy or an idea that Jesus was simply a supernatural visitant. When we speak of visitant, we speak of one thought to have come from a spirit world, but not God. The Docetists went ahead to say that Jesus seemed to be human, but really a kind of a phantom. In other words, saying that he never was real. In other words, he never existed. Saying that he was a teacher who did not die for sins. Now you just see that even within the very time of the apostles, challenges were there. And the immediate attack that you see way back in first century, it was the attack on the humanity of Christ. The attack on the humanity of Christ. That's why in first John 4 1, John started by cautioning against the seducing spirits. And he said to the true Christians to test them. He also actually went on to tell them how and how they would distinguish between the spirits. First John 4, 1 to 3 makes it very clear, reading from the text here. Beloved, don't believe every spirit. That is to indicate that it is possible to believe every spirit. But now this is actually the imperative. You're being instructed, you're being commanded, if you're a true believer, not to believe every spirit, indicating that those that will not pay heed, that won't pay attention, they will go on believing every spirit. But to they that are genuine Christians, they are being instructed not to believe every spirit. But he says, test the spirits to see whether they are from God. That is to indicate there are spirits that are from God and there are those that are not from God. The key thing is to test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Why does the apostle say that test the spirits? So different men as they speak, they are speaking under the influence of different spirits. So when you say person speaking, ask yourself a question. Is he speaking by the spirit of God or is speaking by another spirit? For there are many other spirits. There is only one Holy Spirit. But there are many other spirits that are falsy spirits. And so he says, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, if they had gone out into the world during the time and the era of the Apostle John, 
think of the time where you and I are living. We are having an avalanche of many false prophets. The language of false prophets is not new to us today who are living in this century. Verses 2. By this you know how. By this you know the Spirit of God. So he even tells them how they were to know the Spirit of God and distinguish it from other spirits. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. He says the one big thing here to consider is that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So you see that the attack on the humanity of Christ is so very much central even within the first century. And to they of his time and to us that would come after many years, he warns, he warned them and he warns us. But now, we shouldn't just take that on a surface value. There are many today that do acknowledge that Christ came in the flesh, but they have other beliefs that are indeed very erroneous, that are unfit for human consumption. So we don't only test in this area, we test also in other areas. But this is one of the major and crucial area that the apostle was led to write about. And there are many today, you know, the Muslims, they are actually centrally known for this, the rejection of Christ, that he came from God. Three, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. There, the friends, our friends that are known as the Muslims are just being made naked by the scripture here. They are not our brothers. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. So you see that the humanity of Christ was attacked early even within the days of the apostles. And John continued to warn those in his time and us of today that since the two natures existing in one person is a mystery, it is easy for men to deny and distort that which they fail to comprehend. Consider with me Second John, Second John, verses 7 and 8. John says, Many, for many deceivers, have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. This was an eminent teaching and a central teaching during the time of the apostles that had to be safeguarded against many liars. And John saw it in his time, and God allowed that this warning should be in the canon. And so that's why John says, Watch yourselves, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. False teaching is something that one has gotten not to play with. This is the issue of life and death matter. If an individual plays around about what he or she believes, you're playing with fire. You're playing with your own soul. You need to be biblically sound. You ought not to believe everything. What you believe has to agree with the teaching of the scriptures. If your teaching goes above that which is written, you are in actually a dangerous ground. You are trading your soul for something else. And today, the Docetic heresy has again resurfaced like John warned with the modern day groups that are known as the Jehovah's Witness, the Mammons, the SDAs, and some Pentecostal groups denying and distorting the humanity of Christ. These groups are very common today with huge followings. There's a lot that the Mammons believe wrongly about Christ, the Jehovah's Witness, and then the Seventh-day Adventist, who like to refer to Christ as Angel Mike. Not knowing that the humanity of Christ was essential if he was to die as a truly or real representative for human sinners. What would make redemption very possible? We needed a God man, truly God, truly man. Fully God, fully man. For our atonement, for our redemption, 
to take place. It's why actually Acts 20, the verse is actually 28, teaches what it teaches. It is why 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19, teaches what it teaches. That in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and uh, entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So, before we consider the church councils as far as they stand against the ancient heresies, let's begin by considering what scripture abundantly teaches about the divinity and the humanity of Christ. A careful look onto John 1.1 1, 1, says that in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. That verse alone just shows you that Jesus existed before anything was. When you roll down to John 1, 5 to 9, scriptures are very clear that indeed Jesus was the agent of creation and he was the source and he is the source of life and light. Scripture says, the light shineth in darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. When you do continue in the Gospel of John, we do see the seven declaration of Jesus' grace with God's name that was first used in Exodus 3, 14, which is, I am who I am. The Greek translation is ego emi. I just want us to roll down by considering seven different places where Jesus actually used the name of God as an evidence to us that are reading the text that do believe in our Lord Jesus Christ that indeed he was God manifest in the flesh. John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Who can say that other than God himself? In John 6, 12, he said, I am the light of the world. Who else can go and run out and say, I am the light of the world? Christians, we have been called to let our light shine, but we cannot say emphatically that you as an individual Christian, you can claim the honor that belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ alone. In John 7, in John chapter 10, verses 7 and verses 9, Jesus said, I am the door still using ego emi, the name that was first used in Exodus 3, 14. Because Moses was saying, how would I respond to the Israelis that who has sent me? And he said to him, tell them, I am has sent me. And so that great I am of Exodus, Jesus carries on to himself that very title also in John chapter 10 verses 11 when he said, I am the good shepherd. Again in John 11, 25, he said that I am the resurrection and the life. In John 14, 6, he said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John 15, 1 to 5, he said, I am the true vine. Not only that, when Thomas was doubting whether Christ had risen from the dead, he said a lot of statements that demanded proof that until I touch into his palms and I touch his side where he was pierced. After some good days, the Lord appeared before all his apostles and also Thomas was around. And the first thing that the Lord did was to tell Thomas that this is now the moment for you to quit all your doubts. See, I am not a ghost. A ghost has no bones or flesh. And uh, he was given permission to feel the hands of the Lord and to touch his side. And eventually in John chapter 20 verses 28, Thomas, one of the disciples said, My Lord, my God. This all speaks to the divinity of Christ. It speaks to his deity that he was God manifest in flesh. In Philippians 2, 6, Paul says that Christ was in the form of God. In Colossians 1, 15 to 17, the scriptures are very clear that Christ was the image of the invisible God, which does not actually disagree from what Jesus said in John 14, that whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Still in Colossians 1, 15 to 17, we know all things were created through Christ and for him alone. And we know that all things do consist in Christ, Colossians 1, 17. In Colossians 2.9, the fullness of Godhead all dwells bodily in Christ. Hebrews 1.3 is also very clear that all things that were created 
are held by the word of his power. The same that you still do see in Hebrews 1, the verse 6. The Bible says that let God's angels worship him. We know all, all of us know very much well that the New Testament forbids the worship of angels, but it is still the New Testament that actually the worship of angels, Colossians 2.18, Revelation 22.8-9, but it is still the New Testament that, that commands us to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1.6, we also see the book of Philippians chapter 2 verses 9-11, to how his name has been exalted above all other names and now each and every tongue has to confess that jesus is lord and every knee in heaven on earth and under the earth has to bow down before christ so the number of scriptures that do speak to the deity of christ the divinity of christ that that would have considered but for the sake of time i beg to i beg to consider only those as we also now begin to see Right away from the scriptures, what do the scriptures teach us about the humanity of Christ? About the humanity of Christ. Now remember, as far as his divinity, I did not even touch on his miracles. I did not touch them at all. Those ones, they speak for themselves. But now, speaking about his humanity, we also need to understand that to make our redemption possible, Jesus had to become the sinner's substitute on the cross. There was no any way how sins would have been forgiven without us having the God man. Without us having the God man. It's why Acts chapter 20 and, a verse, and a verses 28 say what it says. It says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God. Listen which he obtained with his own blood. It is why, actually, First Peter says what it says. 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And so, scriptures like John 1.14 concretizes on the issue, showing us that the word in the beginning that was with God and was God, Later on, put on flesh. Why did he put on flesh? Matthew 121 is very clear that Mary was to give birth to a son and he had to be given the name of Jesus Christ, meaning that he would be the savior of all his people. The same is true, you see, as far as actually Matthew chapter 20 and the verses 28, which says that actually, even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What can we fail to see still, actually, as far as uh, John 1, 29, when John the Baptist saw him coming, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. As if that is not enough, John 3, 13 to 17, for we know when God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What can we also miss to say about Romans 5, 8, that says, that but God shows his love for us. In that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. How about Romans chapter 8 and the verses actually 30, 32, which says that he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Second Corinthians 5, 19 to 21. We quoted it earlier. Second Corinthians 8, 9. How he was made poor. Philippians, how he died a criminal's death. So, all these scriptures do concretize about the humanity of Christ. That to make our redemption possible, Jesus had to become the sinner's substitute on the cross. And all the four Gospels continue to show Jesus experiencing human limitation. Case in point, Matthew chapter 4 verses 2 speaks that Jesus felt anger. He was angry. And then... When you consider John 4, 6 speaks about the, his weariness, how he was tired, just like all of us that do have these physical bodies. John eleven thirty five 35, it speaks about the pain he experienced at the tomb of Lazarus. That is humanity. And then the agony in Gethsemane, 
Mark 14:32-42. All that agony that he went through speaks of his humanity. And still, and still the temptation and the pressure he experienced. Hebrews 2, 14 to 17, Hebrews 4, 14. All of those experiences of Christ, they do speak to his humanity. And they are indeed the guarantee to you and I that we can always go to him in full confidence to receive help. In a time of need, since himself, he experienced the same things we are undergoing. Hebrews 4.16 says that we can now approach the throne of grace and receive hope and mercy in the time of need. And uh, Hebrews 5.2 makes it also very clear that he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. So all those things that we have considered as far as the deity or the divinity and the, actually the humanity of Christ from the scripture, they all do just communicate one simple truth. That Trinity and incarnation belong together. Trinity and incarnation belong together. That is to mean that the doctrine of the Trinity declares that the man Jesus was truly divine. So that doctrine speaks that yes, Jesus the man Jesus was truly and fully divine. However, the doctrine of incarnation declares that the divine Jesus is truly man, is fully man. That's what we call the God man. Fully God, fully man. Truly God, truly man. So, now, as we bring this to a close, we ought also to consider that two church councils in church history that affirmed the deity or the divinity and the manhood or what we call the humanity of Christ. I want to begin by considering the council at Nicaea, AD 325. AD 325. The council at Nicaea countered the Arian heresy or idea that Jesus was God's first creation. Listen to that. That Jesus was God's first creation. It's a popular thing among the Jehovah's Witnesses. They look at Christ as God's first creation. But we have seen from Hebrews 1 6, all angels are commanded to worship him and God's angels do not receive worship from any man. So that Arian heresy was very common in the third century. And so that church didn't keep quiet about it. It's why we all know that actually Titus 1.9 is very clear that a good elder should be a man that holds firmly to the faithful word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict. So what did the council at Nicaea do after hearing about the Arian heresy? The church affirmed at the council of Nicaea 3. 25 AD, that Jesus was of the same substance or essence, i.e. the same existing entity as the Father. Thus, there is one God, not two. The council went ahead to affirm that the distinction between the Father and the Son is within their divine unity and that Jesus, though he is the only begotten, but is not made. The church settled that when it came to the divinity or the deity of Christ, it was the council at Nicaea that settled the heresy of Arianism to say that Jesus was simply a mere creation. And so this is a cardinal thing, like I started by elaborating, that what you believe about Christ determines and says a lot about where you are going to spend eternity. If you only see him, as a mere creation, as a good teacher. You only see him as a good person, a religious person that has ever walked on the face of the earth. There is no salvation for you. Peter the Apostle is very clear when he was speaking in Acts 4 to a love. We are given no any other name under the heavens by which we can be saved, but only in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But only in the name of Jesus Christ. Still speaking, in Acts Chapter 13, the verse is 43. The apostle said in Acts chapter 10, still speaking, P 
Peter the Apostle, in the house of Cornelius, he said in verse 38, Let it be known to you therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Who can forgive sins but God alone, but God alone. All of these do speak to what we call the divinity or the deity of Christ. It should not be taken for granted. If you're playing with your soul, the devil is not playing with your soul. If you're playing with the false teachers, you're playing with a matter of death and life issue. It's high time you separate from men and women and fellowships that do not hold to the apostolic teachings that we do have in the 66 books of the Bible. The second council is the Council of Chalcedon. The Council of Chalcedon, AD 451. AD 451. The church at Chalcedon addressed the confusion of the doctrine of the incarnation, countering both Nestorian heresy that Jesus was two personalities, the Son of God and man under one skin. The church still at the Council of Chalcedon countered the Eutychian heresy or idea that Jesus' divinity had swallowed up his humanity. Remember, we have warned many of you, even in other teachings, this is the very area where the Fanero group actually belongs. They hold to the Eutychian heresy, that the divinity of Christ swallowed up his humanity. In one of uh, their teachings, it's made very clear. They believe that Christ is no longer human. That's what they believe, that Christ is no longer human. Putting that aside, they also believe that Jesus is a divine star as we are. They teach that, that Christ equals me. So that is to say, all this group says that no one can tell the difference between you and the master anymore. You teach and hear see. It's why they believe in the little God's doctrine. It's why they believe in the little God's doctrine. It's a cult that a person has to mark and avoid. But now today, because of people loving to be trendy and seeing where numbers are and a lot of these particular things taking place, they say, this is the best thing taking place. They don't care about what people teach. They don't care about the doctrines. They don't care whether what is being taught agrees with the rest of the apostolic teachings. And so what did the church council at Chalcedon do? The Chalcedon council rejected both Nestorian and Eutychian heresies. The Christians at Chalcedon council affirmed that Jesus is one divine human person in two natures. That's what the church at the council of Chalcedon affirmed. They made it very clear, countering the Nestorian heresy by saying Jesus is one divine human person in two natures. That They went ahead to say that the two natures are united in his personal being without confusion, separation, or division, and that each nature retains its own attributes. The council was very clear. It's what we call the hypostatic union, a union without confusion. That divinity is not lost in the humanity, and the humanity is not lost in the divinity. The council went, went ahead to say that all attributes, all qualities, and powers that are in us, as well as all the qualities and powers that are in God, were, comma, are, and ever will be, really, and distinguishably present in the one person of the man from Galilee. That's what actually the council at Chalcedon actually affirmed. In the, the late British theologian that was known as J.I. Parker said that the religion that lacks the emphasis of the divinity and the humanity of Christ is not Christianity. 
let there be no mistake about that. End of quote. So, this is it, dear ones. We say some of the things we say, not that we are biased about particular individuals, we have unhealed things against particular individuals, but this is the truth. We ought to contradict all those that speak that which exalts itself above that which is written. Dear ones, if you have been actually shaky unto the two natures of Christ, I pray by God's grace that this teaching will minister to you and answer many of your questions. The two councils I've quoted, the council at Nicaea, AD 325, and the council at Chelsadon, AD 451, they are long documents. I just gave you a summary. You can Google them and learn more about what took place. But there is enough in this that I have done to actually I open you and for you to really know what do you believe. For you really to test what you believe. What I've said resonates with all that you've been holding on to. Continue. But if it has sparked something to think that there's something I have said that disagrees with what you believe, then you need to examine and check what you believe. Because what I've just shared with you, it's what we do see in the scriptures. Lord willing, we shall continue from here. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.